been uh, really lucky to meet Lars. Um, he's a real dynamic guy and he almost every interaction with him leaves you inspired and he, he's very good at building you up. And so I've really, really enjoyed showing with him. It's been really great. Absolutely. And uh, what, what, what's on offer for the, for the public here in Cape Town? So here we've got um, my Port City Treasures. And so basically Cape Town, every culture has arrived in Cape Town bringing the best of their culture. And what I'm doing is I'm taking little bits of everything from the antique markets and producing tiles. And that means that when you hang one of these pieces in your home, no matter where your guest is from in the world, when they look at this, they'll find a little bit of their own culture. And I think that... What a detail here. Absolutely. And what I love about this is when you zoom in with your cell phone camera, the detail, there's, there's more and more detail. There's more detail than the human eye can see. So some devils in that detail? Well, I think that uh, I think we definitely purify our soul by working hard, and um, yeah, the devil is in the detail, but the liberation is in the hours in the studio. And you know, your classic uh, uh, ceramics is this a sort of a, are you moving into other other, other sort of genres? So I also make bowls. I make bowls for uh, the Test Kitchen, which is a very famous Cape Town restaurant. And I just, I love the engagement. So for me, I'm a very sociable person. And if I get to work with other chefs or other artists, it's, it's very freeing. Um, I spent 20 years in my studio. And when you work from home, it becomes very isolating and so you crave sociability and so much so that I moved my studio into Montebello Design Center and for the last two years people just drop in and they have a cup of tea and it's bliss. <laughs> it's a bit of an artistic hub there isn't it? It is, yeah, there are 25 studios and it's, it's really great waking up in the morning and knowing that your landlord is a public benefit organization and that this public benefit organization, their mandate is to further design. And so it's a really, you feel embraced and hugged and held, held safe. Um, and also they, they, they nurture ideas. So you can go to the, the board and say, you know, like I think it would be things would improve a little bit if we do this or if we do that and they really they're really interested. So Montebello Design Center I'd love one day to be able to gift such a thing to to the world. Don't you also have a studio in Betty's Bay? Yeah. No, that's um, that another John, John Ellis. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's a competition. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, um, he makes very different work. So what I do is I, I focus on research, so my work is very research based and I rely on the fact that no one else is willing to put in the time. And so that's how I separate my aesthetic by working very much Yeah, very much in a very unique field and there are not a lot of people who would even try and create something like this so I think that's that's what I'm doing is I'm, I'm really trying not to compete with anyone and, and forge uh, be part of the avant-garde within ceramics and the target market for a piece like this you. <laughs> Well, what I love about making work like this is it's not only my sweat and equity, but the hundreds of craftsmen that made all these objects, the original objects, and that's generations of sweat equity. So, yes, I've created something that's it's a mammoth task to create a piece like this, but it's also celebrating the thousands of other mammoth tasks that preceded and I always feel that we are dwarfs standing on the shoulders of giants and you know if I look at what was possible two or three generations ago and what's possible now we really are reaping the rewards of a lot of hard work from our preceding generations. Is this almost a milestone piece for you? Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, one of the things I love to do is uh, swim long distances underwater on one breath. And this piece is like after all that work, surfacing, you know. Uh, I hope that translates to the audience. You can breathe. And yeah. some of the intricacies here, yeah, some of the inspirations. So, uh, this here is a little netsuki, and I've included snook jaws, so they, they fish teeth. Um, this is the inside of a watch. This is a, a carving in ivory of Franklin. Um, this here is a little netsuki and I've used a cinnabar uh, carving in the background. And is it the significance of being Franklin? Um, it's just a beautifully crafted piece. Uh, usually pieces that are carved into ivory have a level of care and detail because it's a material that's very hard to come by. And so usually if a piece is made of plastic, it's not necessarily of a very fine craftsmanship, but something like ivory or glass or bronze or gold, the craftsmanship on these pieces is really pinnacle moments in, in, in artisanship. And that's why I seek them out, I collect them. I've got a vast collection of really fantastic things and then I reference them in my work. Absolutely. And, and the material, is it? It's a porcelain. Porcelain. So... A hundred years ago, that's fine in the ivory. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, so porcelain is wonderful because we have such a fine ceramics industry in Cape Town. We have the cheapest electricity on earth. Everyone's complaining about the electricity going up in price, but... It's cheaper than everywhere else. And so it enables us to be a lot more creative. We can take creative risks without worrying about the financial punishment of failure. And therefore we can leap, we can dive, we can swim, we can set our minds free and create work that really fulfills our hearts. And you've obviously had quite a bit of interest from overseas over the years. I have. I had a very nice relationship with a chain in the States called Anthropology, and they did some very good business with me, which really perpetuated me believing in myself because they declared me one of the five top designers on earth, which was very intimidating. But <laughs> it was also quite a blessing because it was a very short list of people I had to kill to be number one. Uh, and this is also very intricate as well. So what I'm really excited by is I've just launched the, the vision to tile a whole building in unique tiles. And so it's very exciting for me. I've started producing um, these tiles and I have an agreement with the gallery that for every tile they sell, they'll put one on the front of their building. And so over time, the, the level will rise up the front of the building to all four stories. And so I'm really excited to be working with Gallery 111. And um, I hope to be very busy for a very long time, possibly even forever. <laughs> and you got an interesting story how you met your wife through, uh, through she was a nice intern of yours. No, uh, what happened was I got a, I got a phone call, uh, I got an email, and I thought, well, I'll, I'll phone in and, and see what, what's what. Um, but it was a very interesting situation because I had a Swedish intern sitting there reading my email to me and my kiln was being packed and I was doing a little bit of admin and I phoned and I said, hi, um, it's John Bauer and her voice went, the voice went, oh, oh, um, hello. And we all looked at each other and we just knew in that moment this was the one. And I'm very, I was an incubator baby, so I'm incredibly tone sensitive. And so, yeah, it was, it was like a whirlwind romance. I said to her, I'm an artist, it's not necessarily the easiest of life. I'm not interested in anything casual, this is either the path to marriage or the path to the door and she chose marriage so Amen. Yeah. And the art continues and, and these other two pieces here. Yeah.
So yeah, this one I'm using Zips and this is a Madagascan quartz crystal. This here is an Indian paisley design and these stars I've carved with a porcupine quill. Tchaikovsky's face I see as a, it's a modern day Christ face. It's very serene, when you look at it you feel calm, you feel relaxed, it's, it's a calming face. Here's Tchaikovsky again. Do you travel, travel a lot for inspiration? Uh, I, 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 I like to travel Milton Market where <laughs> the whole world drains into Milton Market and then spreads out like a, a halo. So I have traveled to India. I spent six months in India, which is why I love using the Indian wood blocks and these kinds of crafts and the stone carving in India. I went to Mahali Balipuram and actually bought my chisels there and they said to me that the chisels have been made the same way for 5,000 years in that town. So it's amazing working with tools with such a heritage. And I, I presume you, when you can you pass on your skills to the next generation of craftsmen and women? I do, I do and rather contentiously I, I have a bouquet of skills that I pass on and a bouquet of skills that I keep private. And it's amazing because no matter how many times you tell the people this is what I'm prepared to teach and this is what I'm not prepared to teach, they always think they're going to get out of you your secret recipes. And I'm like, I formulated those over the last 20 years and you've been here for 20 minutes. <laughs> you know, there's not really, you know, a, a balance. And I think we live in the instant gratification society where people, they just want to know how. And I'm like, but I've developed this unique aesthetic and this palette. And, and if I tell you, I make the world a poorer place. But if I teach you how to think and how to research and if I teach you how to perpetuate knowledge I make the world a bigger place and a better place and so that's what I try and be to others I try and be a lighthouse of how to achieve not what to achieve absolutely and any, any other pieces here where we should, we should be looking out yeah um, So this piece is actually the companion piece of my necklace and so what I do is I create these, these slices that then in the making of the bowl they then stretch out and develop this tubular feeling, this tubular nature and I'm really excited by what I'm achieving in these works and my next project is to make enough of these to tile a building and so both matchbox tiles and round tiles with circles are what I'm planning on cladding buildings with because I believe that in the gallery is one thing but on the gallery making it touchable for people just walking past in the street that they are able to reach out and touch. And I really feel that art is a modern day Christ. And that famous story of Christ, how he, he turned and he said, but who touched me? And they said to him, there are thousands of people here. Like, what do you mean, who touched you? He said, no, somebody touched me who believed. And this lady stepped forward and said, I touched you. And thank you, I'm healed. And I think art has the ability to heal our society. We live in such a violent society. And for me, it's becoming a father. You become so much more tuned into the pain of others around you. Because they too are fathers and they too are mothers. And how do, how do we reach them? How do we build bridges and create communities of mutual understanding and mutual love and so that's what I'm doing with these beads because we're rolling out a project where people we give them 10 beads free and a board and then they sell them and then they've got the money to buy more 
And so we are saying it's okay for us to lose 10 beats. It's the risk we're going to run because even if nine people never come back, if one out of 10 people come back and we've made a difference for just 10% of the people that we reach, that's a worthwhile difference. And we have no choice. We have to create solutions. Time is running out, I feel, for this country. So do you have uh, some success stories from the underprivileged areas where youngsters embracing art? There's a great success story called the Butterfly Project, and they're based at Montebello Design Center, but they take art into all the schools. And uh, her name's Angela, and she's got a massive team. And she is unbelievable. She's a powerhouse of fundraising and she brings in the funds and gets the funds into the right hands, into art materials, into schools, and into facilitators. And they've got a large complement of staff who are facilitators in schools. And it's such a beautiful story. And I mean, she was just my neighbor at Montebello. I had no idea until I actually attended one of their shows. And the stories from the kids, it's, yeah. I think art is the wonderful thing because you can take some two things of no value and just smash them together and then it has value and it's it's this it's the collision of comets that creativity converts into art and art is it's humane. People believe in art. And art is creating a new elite group of saints who get to touch lives and heal people. Um, William Kentridge has a very large fund that he actively funnels into the arts. The Spear Arts Academy is amazing. They've got the Creative Block Project where they, they buy six artworks from every artist every month. And if you are living in the townships and you're guaranteed of selling six artworks a month, you are earning more than the average person in your community. You are a rich person. And these vital systems for social change go far beyond what sport can do because sport is about your physicality and you've got a shelf life. It's like being a supermodel, you know. You, you, you fear when it's all gonna end and the bubble's gonna burst. But in the art world, you know, the older you get, the more valuable your work. And so, in an age where we probably are all gonna live till 200, it's rewriting the rules of what art is and where you're going and what we're doing. And I think that art gives us hope because a lot of people, a lot of my peers, I say, you're going to live till 200. And they've been banking on retiring at 65 and dying at 75. And they're like thinking, I'm going to starve to death. And, and, and whereas as an artist, if you're going to live till 200, it's only going to get better and better. And so we need to pass through a, a conceptual shift and realize that how we evaluate time and how we evaluate our lives needs to change. And, and obviously art is very vital as a therapy as well? Well, yes, but any pleasurable activity is vital as a therapy. I mean, laughing yoga, you know, um, there's this one guy, a laughing yoga guru, who goes like, laughing yoga, laughing, robbing the bank yoga. <laughs> and he goes through every bizarre activity, like changing the tire laughing yoga, like <laughs> And yeah, I mean, I think that art as a therapy, if you aren't necessarily that good at art, can be a crushing therapy. <laughs> but everyone can laugh. And so, if you are broken and wounded, start with laughing yoga. And if you're good at art, try art. And if you've just got, you know, a 200 year life expectancy, it's 
it's enough time to get good at it, even if you're not. So I love where the world is going and I love the future that we are imprinting as a, as a species because the future is going to be amazing and I'll see you there. And finally, any, any other expressions in the future which we should look out for? Um, yes, um, invite me. I'm, I'm, I'm probably ready to show in your gallery or in your lounge. You know, I'm, I'm a big fan of art as a Tupperware party because Tupperware parties have proven themselves. There's even Lord Tupper, you know, and so if Tupperware is now firmly rooted in the British aristocracy, we should um, not only accept this model but love it and embrace it. And so if you wanted to invite me around for a, a porcelain Tupperware party and all your friends have a spare 250,000 Rand to spend, I'm the John Jim Rand. <laughs> <laughs>